trails and ghost towns with Mike Roberts and Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, our tour guide for Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. And today we head to a part of the country we've sort of skimmed by before, but uh, I guess we call it the boundary country generally. Yeah, it's the most, one of the most historic areas in British Columbia, Mike. At, in the 1890s, it was the boundless boundary because it had everything. It had mineral riches, it had everything. And of course, this area we're concentrating on today is a little known town called Midway, about 600 people now. But in the early days, it really wasn't attracted to the, to, the, to the mining community. It was attracted to the Indians. And the Indians, of course, it was a wide expanse, got lots of sunlight, good hunting in the area. And they settled there and came across from both sides of the line. And eventually, when the line was established, Mike, in 1860-61, they twisted a tree, so the story goes, and the tree's still standing. And they entwined the tree. It's called the entwined tree. And they said, though divided we are united still, we are one people. And, but after the Indians, and they began to go their separate ways, still drifting across the line. Into the area came some American miners, and they discovered a creek called Boundary Creek. And Boundary Creek, 1858 or 1859, hard to tell which year, and it was very rich. Ounce a day diggings, extremely rich. In fact, the Americans established a little town right what they thought was on the American side of the border. It wasn't, it was on the Canadian side. So the plaster miners are there right after the Indians. And this is the country we're talking about today. Okay. Midway, we head to there right after we come back from this break. Don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley visiting the Boundary Country, specifically Midway. Although it, did, it didn't get that name for a little while. No. What happened, Mike, was this. Is first of all, it was a natural town site. It really was, because there were three routes coming into this area. One was from the north, and this was probably the most important. It came from towns like Grand Forks, and there was a smelter at Grand Forks. Greenwood, there was a smelter at Greenwood. And on this side of Greenwood, there were a number of other small towns. There was well, Deadwood just on the other side, then a place called Anaconda. And Anaconda was a rival. There's, there's, there's the main street of Anaconda, probably about 1898. Where did they get a name like Anaconda? Well, uh, very interesting, because the original name Anaconda was named probably after the a Anaconda in, in Montana. And the guy who discovered the Anaconda mine, which gave rise to the name Anaconda, was a Union soldier. And he remembered the words of his, his general, I, uh, probably was Grant, and Grant said he would squeeze the Confederate forces like a giant Anaconda. And he named his mind the Anaconda. That came into, into Canada. And here it comes into Canada. Sure. Wonderful so, connections. Well, sure, a lot of these guys were Americans. And, uh, you know, so you come, you come down the valley towards Midway, and you get into a little place called Boundary Falls. And Boundary Falls had the famous Sunset Smelter. And here's the, here's the Sunset Smelter. And it got ore from the number seven and the Texas and some other mines. Didn't last too long, Mike. But everyone thought the boundary was, and it was, you know, it was fabulously rich at that time. There was Phoenix and, and uh, all, all sorts of camps, a dozen mining camps in the boundary country at that time. So the north route was important, and so was the west route, because in the west you had, you had Carmine and Beaverdale and, uh, and uh, Camp McKinney and the Okanagan. And the south route was becoming important, because the <laughs> south route was across the U.S. line, just across the Cattle River. And that south route had places like Republic and, and Curlew and Danville, so it was important. And people realized it was important, and so people began to start settling in this particular area. And it, from what you've told me, it wasn't the entrepreneurs who came first. For some reason, government started well, sure. our ball rolling here. The government, I think, realized that it was a natural town site. So they established a courthouse and some government offices, the jail, uh, stations, uh, the, the provincial police in the area. And this is an early shot of, of how Midway we looked just after the turn of the century. And uh, to build up a little bit and there's the center part of it and of course now here we get down into the actual uh, a, a, a more uh, later shot of Midway and it shows three or four of the hotels here and actually Mike what happened was there were five hotels in Midway there was Kroll's Hotel which is named after a guy called Kroll uh, there was the Commercial Hotel there was the Midway Hotel there was this uh, there was the the uh, Spokane Hotel and the Lancashire Hotel and the interesting part about it is that practically all of these owners were, were American citizens at one time. They drift across the line. Some of them were very tough customers. And one of the toughest customers of all was the owner of the Spokane Hotel, a guy called Lou Salter. Yeah. 
Got a, he was a, uh, he was a man who believed in insurance, I understand. <laughs> I, I <laughs> this guy was on the run from somewhere. We right. don't know where. We have, but possibly from Spokane, certainly south of the border. And he regularly slept with a loaded 45 under his pillow. And he did that all his life from the time he arrived in, in the, in the uh, yeah. Midway area right till his death in the 1940s. To say this man was a proud entrepreneur as well as a careful one would be to understate it. This cash register is custom made for him. Oh, sure. And uh, it says L.E. L. Salter in brass right on the front. He was very proud of this. And very few of these cash registers, Mike, are actually made for the individual with the individual's name on them. That cost them quite a bit more. And if you open that bottom drawer, which we don't have to, it says L.E. Salter, Midway, B.C. I'm glad you're not asking me to, to lug this one today. I, I lug heavy stuff. This, <laughs> how much would this weigh? This is a, a heavy baby. Well, that weighs about 200 pounds. We had a tough time carrying it in. It's very heavy indeed. Now, do you pick one of these things up for your collection, just sort of uh, by and by? How do you happen on something as as precious as that. Well, Mike, I picked this up about, uh, I guess, 15 years ago in Grand Forks. Somebody had bought a lot of Lou Salter stuff, including his, his poker chips and his cash register, and uh, I, bought, I bought all the stuff off them, because Lou Salter was a very fa famous character even when I was a kid. Well, it takes you right back to the spot. The man sure. with the 45 under his pillow, yeah. the cash register, yeah. his pride, and his business. But, but he wasn't the only guy. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot, of, a lot of tough customers in this town, and one of the toughest customers was a guy called Charles Tomant. And again, here was a mysterious man. He was, he was, uh, oh, here's a picture of him. And this is a marvelous picture. Here's Charles Tomat, probably with a, with a 30-30 Winchester, which is the, which is the all-purpose rifle and a magnificent horse. And he's a lawman. And he's the typical lawman of the 1890s and the turn of the century. Tall, doesn't say too much, handlebar mustache, crack shot, either with a rifle or with a pistol. Marvelous rider, good tracker, and he had lots of work. <laughs> and the reason he had lots of work, Mike, is because there were a lot of ranchers in there. I mean, they, you know, there are ranchers still in that country, like the Fritzes and, uh, and um, the Harpers, and, and a lot of those old ranchers are still there. But in the early days, it attracted a lot of rustlers. Americans coming over the line, picking up a few cattle and a few horses, drifting back across the line. So they brought in Charles Tomat. And Charles Tomat cured it very, very quickly. He didn't have much trouble. And what trouble he did, he, they didn't last very long. So he put a lot of these rustlers in jail. And he had some knockdown drag out fights with him. He never lost a fight. And, but the thing was, it harbored some deep, deep resentments. And he was hated by the rustlers and the rustling community, especially south of the line. So he was a very interesting character indeed. There's a very good reason why rustlers occurred at this spot. I mean, the line is really important, isn't it? The American border right there, uh, if they needed to jump to Canada, they could jump. If they needed to jump to the States, they could jump. It's an important spot. Well, the reason it's important is because of the mining history of the area. And so we, we find that the CPR came into this area, and they're sitting there in 1900. Yeah. And they stopped at Midway. And now, I don't know why they stopped. And, and of course, their, their great rival is, is the Great Northern Railway. And unknown to them, or perhaps they did know it, but driving from the south and up through Ferry, Washington, is, is James J. Hill, James Jerome Hill. Who hates, uh, who hates Shaughnessy of the, of the CPR with a, with a black Irish passion. They're both Irishmen. They've known each other for years, and they despise each other. Absolute dis... They're, they're dis it, they gets, it keeps them nothing. going, I think. Oh, sure it does. <laughs> and they, they, fought a, they fought a continuous feud. And what happened was this, is that James J. Hill, Mike, had managed to secure the rights of way, all the rights of way heading west. And the CPR blocked him with a couple of lots. But they knew that was only temporary because at that time, because of railroad law, he could apply to buy those lots at fair market value. So he did. He was held up a little bit by the CPR, but finally he gets, he gets it through the courts. And they, they rule in favor of James J. Hill because he's probably liked a little better than the CPR. Is it? <laughs> Even though he's an American. You know, the courts in this case were blind. I mean, oh. they, they didn't have a nationality. I mean, they That's would have right. normally gone CPR, but yeah. this was blind justice. Oh, sure inaccurately. And they realized he wanted to go west, so he, st he brings in a crew of about 150 men, and he starts laying down track, moving west out of, out of Midway, up the Kettle Valley. And as he moves west, the CPR brings in a troubleshooter. And the troubleshooter is a guy called Freddie McLean. And Freddie McLean's a real hothead. And he says, well, if we can't stop him in the courts of law, we can stop him in other ways. And so the, 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 the VV&E, which is really the Great Northern, the okay. Vancouver, Victoria, and Eastern, and they lay down a bunch of track one night. They come back the next morning, and they see ruination. 
The track is twisted around trees and the ties are gone and they're, they're in a pile, they're burning, and the right of way is dug up. Well, they're, 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 they're a little unhappy about this, to say, <laughs> to say the least. Your control is oh, admirable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. They're very unhappy. And then McLean, to, to add fuel to the fire, he comes down with about 300 men and warns the VV&E crews that they better not move one other foot. Well, that doesn't take long for the VV&E. They, they wire down to James J. Hill, and he sends up a bunch of guys from places like Ferry, Washington. And these guys were real tough customers. Some of them were shot through from cheek to cheek. And he wasn't too worried about their CVs, you know. He didn't care what kind of background they had. Yeah. So they come in, and they, uh, they pick up the nearest, uh, the nearest tool and the nearest <laughs> weapon, and some of them are picks and shovels, and, and there's some shots fired, Mike. And it becomes a very, very touchy situation. A lot of, lot of very bloody fist fights. And uh, how many didn't... guys are now in in this little fray? Now there are seven hundred. God. Oh. And so uh, swinging hammers and picks and. Sure, sure. They're ready. They're ready to do battle. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and uh, and and here. Oh, here's an, here's the, here's a marvelous photo at the time. This is 1905. And here they are, they're eyeing each other across the rights of way, and this is the so-called scene of the Midway War. And they're really not in action here, and, uh, but they did come into action. And what happened was, is that, that James J. Hill began to protect his, his railway with, with wooden barricades and barbed wire and all the rest. And it started getting out of hand, but who's there? Mr. Charles Thomas. Thomas. Sure. But what as one... A BC policeman, a BC <laughs> provincial policeman, do with 700 people <laughs> at each other's throats. Well, Charles Tom, that's a very resourceful guy. He has two special constables with him. Oh, two all. special <laughs> constables. Yeah, so Canadian police are in action, and uh, three of them against 700. So he figures out, well, the, the easiest thing to do, first of all, is close down every bar in Midway, which he does, locks them up tight. They can't get any liquor. That's this doesn't stop these guys. It doesn't. I That's right. think this so, doesn't no? stop these guys because they drift right across the river and they go into Ferry, Washington. Here's Ferry, Washington. And here's where they hole up and they start drinking out every bar here and they, they run them right out of liquor. And three of these guys in the VV&E decide that they're going to get rid of our friend Freddie McLean. The troublemaker from the CPR. The troublemaker from the CPR. So they, they kidnap him and they take him, they take him across the river on the Canadian side and they lock him in the Potter House. Who knows what they're going to do with him there. And, but one of the VV&E officials hears about this, and he doesn't want the same treatment from the CPR, so he manages to spring McLean from the Potter House, but this doesn't stop these three troublemakers. <laughs> they go down to see Tomat, and they, they charge him with obstruction. They want him put in jail. Well, McLean goes down and sees Tomat, and he says, I'm charging these guys with kidnapping. I want them in jail. Tomat looks at these four guys who are really wild-eyed now. He locks them all in jail. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> That's the easy way. Yeah. And, uh, and essentially what it did, it diffused that particular, and th th this, this so-called Midway War made headlines right across Canada and even in Europe. They couldn't believe that the railroad crews were, this, this was serious stuff. And what it came from was a long-standing animosity between James Jerome Hill and Thomas Shaughnessy. And they never forgot it, you know. They never forgave each other till their dying days. This is, this is remarkable. But the other side of it is, I mean, range wars started in the United States with a, a tenth that number of people, and here we have 700 guys yep. ready to kill, and yet no fatalities, and three policemen put a halt to it. That's, That's just right. remarkable. Yeah, lots of blood flowing. And, uh, but, but, <laughs> a but, broken but, arm or but two. But at that time, no murders. And what happened was, by 1905, 1906, 1907, James Jerome Hill, James Jerome Hill starts moving that, that, that line west. He does have some, some, some drawbacks, and there's some delays. For instance, seven of his workers were blown into eternity just this side of Anacus uh, near Mincaster because they, they, they hit an unexploded sh round of powder and it, and it blew them all into eternity. So there were a number of accidents on the railway. He then cuts into Molson on the U.S. side. This is a really international railway, you know. And then he comes down <laughs> through Orville and then he comes up past Rich Bar and up into Nighthawk. Then he starts going up on the Smilkameen. So he is really going to capture not only the boundary country, he is going to capture the Smilkameen and all that southern territory. And, uh, and meanwhile, in, in, you know, in, in Midway, things are progressing very slowly indeed. They're not, they didn't need to catch fire. It was just sort of a standard growth, uh, static kind of growth. Yeah. Okay. Take a break here and come back in a second because the story of Midway and the story of some of the characters that we've already alluded to gets hotter and hotter. So when we come back, more on Midway and some fine characters.
Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. We're talking about Midway, 1905, 06, 07. Yep. James J. Hill's uh, gone to make his, his millions toward the Similkameen. Yep. And Midway just hasn't percolated the way they figured. No, Midway didn't catch fire. And, you know, some of the famous names in Midway now have changed occupations. Uh, an example is Charles Tomat, the lawman of those early years. He's, he's now become a hotel keeper. He buys one hotel, Mike. Then he goes into a second hotel, and the second hotel is the Midway Hotel. And this is a very strange guy. Has a lot of enemies in the area, has a lot of admirers. The enemy's generally on the other side of the law. Yeah. And uh, so he settles down on this hotel, and this is the Midway Hotel about 1911. And this is how it looked. You see a cash a, register behind it. Such a great shot. You know, you wonder, what did saloons look like in those days? There are not sure. that many great shots, and this is his. Oh, sure it is, yeah. And he, yeah, he's, uh, he, he's sitting there in this hotel. He's there in 1908. Yeah. Now, you got this. This is actually from Charles Tomat. Yeah, that is indeed. And where did you pick this up? I picked it up from his son, Carl Tomat, about two years before he died. I bought a bunch of stuff from him. Yeah. And these poker chips, Mike, that you're, the, that you're now handling are from the Midway Hotel. You got the were end, there. Right? He told me they were there when his, when his father uh, was actually... Uh, attacked by um, by bandits. All right. So this is the situation. Tomat's got a hotel. Yep. It's the Midway Hotel. Yep. It's doing a land roaring business. Yeah, he's doing very very good business. Yeah. And uh, and it's an August night, 1908, about seven o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Two or three customers are in the hotel, including a bank manager, and they're drinking. And without warning, in the door, bursting in the door, come two men armed, blue blue kerchiefs on there, or masks on. And they have their guns leveled at Tomat. This is an assassination attempt. This, they're going to murder Tomat. Tomat reaches under the bar, grabs a gun, fires off a shot. They fire off two shots. One of them hits Tomat, wounds him mortally. His shot hits the mark too. He wounds one of these robbers. They fire some more shots. He is mortally wounded. They don't know it. So they retreat out the door. And they jump on their horses. Tomat follows them outside. And they ride up the street. And as they ride up the street, they're riding first east and west, and then they're coming towards this old hotel, which is only about two and a half blocks away. And sitting on, on the veranda of this hotel, which we can see up here right now, a great shot. This is a marvelous western hotel, corner door. This is the old Spokane. Guess who's there? Lou Salter is there. He's sitting up there playing poker with five, with five individuals who are playing poker. I don't know the name of three. I know that Lou Salter's there. And there's a Chinese cowboy called Bing. Okay, Bing the Chinese cowboy. Okay. And they're sitting there and they're playing poker, a high stakes game. They hear the shots, they see the commotion, and up the street pound these two guys, and somebody yells, they've shot, they've shot Tomat. Well, Salter reaches behind him on the wall, picks up a 12-gauge shotgun, and these guys are coming down the street towards his hotel, heading west. And he levels that shotgun on these guys, and, and one of them is reeling, kind of listing in the saddle, and he starts to squeeze, squeeze off the shot, and the mask falls down, and he looks, and he lowers the shotgun just momentarily. And then they come down closer, he starts to squeeze off the shot, and he's got him dead to rights. These guys are dead in the saddle. And he looks at that guy again, shakes his head, reaches around, puts the shotgun back on the wall, and they resume, resume their game of poker. He obviously knew these guys. He knew at least that guy. Either that was a guy from his past, or a relative, or a close friend. And he couldn't knock him out of the saddle. He wouldn't knock him out of the saddle. And nothing was ever said about this until years and years later, Mike, when Bing the Chinese cowboy is dying, I think it was 1969, in the Nelson Hospital, and he finally relates the story, and he was there, and that's what happened. What a wonderful thing to discover. Yeah. And you met the guy who Bing related the story to? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you? I met the guy who, who, who got it actually from Bing, who knew Bing. He was a railroader and had known Bing in the early days, and Bing told him. And that's, that's, that's the story of Lou Salter and Bing the Chinese cowboy and what actually happened. And these guys were never caught. They rode across the line and disappeared into history. And this, this area, of course, Mike, is, is one of the great historic areas of the province. And very, very interesting load minerals and very interesting placer gold. And Boundary Creek, as I alluded to before, and I mentioned it very briefly, was a very rich creek. And you know, a few months ago, I met an old friend of mine again, whom I hadn't seen for oh, a number of years, a guy called Gary Colenzo. 
And he said, Bill, he said, do you, uh, do you remember a prospector down at Christina Lake? He said, right across from Kingsley's Hotel. Kingsley's Hotel was on La Valley Point in Christina Lake, fairly about 45 miles away from Midway. Mm -hmm. Oh, I said, there are lots of prospectors. And I said, can you remember his name? He said, no. He said, but I'll tell you what happened. He said, 1946, he said, my Uncle Harry, and his Uncle Harry was Harry Collins, mm -hmm. who really liked a glass of beer <laughs> quite often, more than occasionally. And uh, so Harry would stop up at Kingsley's Hotel, and his young nephew got tired of waiting for Harry, and he struck up a conversation with this old, with this old placer miner. And the placer miner may have been a guy called Dad Odell. Dad he, Odell. Dad Odell, who used to be in Paulson, actually, and went down to Christina Lake. And this guy, anyway, had use of a Model T Ford. And he said to this kid, well, come Come on, I'll take you panning, kid. So these, so Gary Colenso and this old prospector jump in this Model T Ford, and in the Model T Ford, he has a rocker box, which is called a dolly or cradle. And they take it and they go up through Grand Forks, and they go yeah. up through Greenwood, yeah. and they go to past Greenwood and on somewhere on the Boundary Creek, but well off the creek. And the old boy sets up the rocker box, and he gives Gary Colenso two buckets, and Gary Colenso goes down and gets the water because a rocker box is for dry diggings and you have to keep water in it all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's what he does. Gary carries the water and the old man is working the rocker box well back and he can't remember what was the east side or the west side of Boundary Creek, which is a famous creek. Yep. And at the end of the day, Gary said he probably had about half an ounce to three quarters of an ounce of gold just by using a little rocker box. And I said, well, how big were the nuggets? Well, he said, as near as I can remember, some of the nuggets were just bigger than the fingernail and some were just small. He said it was coarse gold, and he said it was kind of a coppery gold, which means it was oxidized gold, old gold. Yeah. And so somewhere up in that creek, and there seems to be an old, an old air, and it doesn't, and it seems to make a fair amount of sense, and I'll tell you why. Because the coarse gold really stops at Norwegian Creek, so there may indeed be a high run up there. So when you come into that Norwegian Creek, which is just above Jolly Jack Thornton's old cabin there, yeah. you'll come across, that's where the coarse gold starts, and then it disappears. So maybe this old guy, through sheer accident on a hunting trip or something, discovered a high yeah. run of, of coarse gold that, that really leads into that, that very, very rich run, which is below Norwegian Creek. So it's, it's a dry run. So the, the young guy, he goes along because he has got to carry the water. Sure. So he's going to be carrying the water uphill somewhere yeah. for 100 yards or something like Definitely that. Definitely on a bench above the creek. Above the creek, above Norwegian Creek. Well, not sure. Uh, Could be below Norwegian Creek. Nearly caught you there. Yeah. I nearly got too close, yeah. didn't I? I think it's about, but I'm yeah. not sure. And in a course of how long he got maybe an ounce, well, three quarters of an they, ounce to an ounce? he went up there three or four times with this old boy. You know, over a stretch of one or two years, one or two summers. And he was, Gary is usually down this. This is 1946, 1947. That's over 30 years ago, Mike. And there's been no big runs. Excuse me. Since there. That's, that's more than 30. That's over 40 years Listen, ago. Listen, it's all right. Time for, is getting to me. It's all right for us guys over 20 to forget <laughs> exactly how far that is. Wonderful. So we've got the Midway War, we've got the Tomat assassination, we've got a potential treasure all in Midway. Join us again for another Gold Trail. Bye-bye.